Good morning and welcome to the Pediatric Emergency Care Coordinated Resource Series. Today our speaker is Jennifer Gold. She is an, uh, a, currently the Pediatric Clinical Care Coordinator for the Pediatric Emergency Room at Bay State Medical Center Level 1 Trauma Center. She has been employed there for over 15 years working as a staff and charge nurse with both adults and pediatrics. She has also been the educator for the night shift. She is a TNCC and ENPC instructor, as well as uh, ACLS, PALS, BL, BLS, and Stop the Bleed instructor. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Today, we're gonna to talk a little bit about some of the red flags of pediatrics. Now, I could talk to you all day about them, but we're gonna do just a short, quick 20 minutes Let's get to the down and dirty and real important red flags. So like I said, we could talk about this for a while, but what we're gonna focus on today is recognizing the red flags of what are the differences between our patients from the young to the old and being able to help identify what is normal versus abnormal. You can't find the red flags if you don't know the difference between normal and abnormal. So as we all know, our pediatric patients are they're not just little adults and they have a wide age span. We go from the neonate at just born all the way up to the adolescent at 18. And not only do they have physical differences at all these different stages, they also have anatomical and developmental differences as well. So it's important to be able to recognize and to know them. An example, do you know what age they're supposed to sit? What age are they supposed to walk? What are the normal, when do they start to learn how to talk. And going back to all those Erickson theories and all the things we learned about in nursing school and pulling back on what are developmental norms. A baby typically around nine, 10 months is when they develop a stranger danger. So it's important to know that. Just don't go reach in and grab that nine, 10 month old to get your assessment. You've now lost that opportunity because now they're scared of you. If you leave them in mom and dad's arms while you get to, you're doing your assessment and you save to the very end of approaching them. You develop the rapport, you smile at them. You can do a lot more with them, with them if you've gained their trust a little bit beforehand. Another example, knowing the physical differences is neonates. There is this myth that they're obligatory nose breathers. Well, they're not truly obligatory nose breathers, but they are nose breathers by preference. So it's just sometimes simple as sucking out their nose with a neosucker or a little bulb syringe can actually improve their breathing status. But it's just knowing those little bit of differences. And when we talk about differences, neonate is usually considered the age group of zero to 28 days. And then an infant is that one month to a year, the toddler is one to three, your preschooler is your three to five, your school age is six to 10, and then 11 up is considered an adolescent. So what do we really wanna know? We wanna know if they're sick or they're not sick. That's really what this is all about. Just the fact that the child shows up to the ER with their patients typically says that they're what they would call sick. They may not require resuscitative measures where we're doing CPR and advanced things, but the parent had a concern enough where they brought the patient there. And sometimes they self-present. You can identify a really sick child right away. And other times you need a little bit more detective work. So what do we get this detective work? The first thing we want to do is we want to talk about the pediatric assessment triangle. Right. That's out across the room, that really quick couple seconds of what are you seeing? And we do this instinctively without even sometimes realizing it. So give yourself some credit for that. You're looking at what do they look like? Are they laying placid? Are they smiling and running around with their parent? The work of breathing, that can get a little trickier. Sometimes it's they're sitting in a certain position. Are they head bobbing that infant that head bobs a little bit? Just moving their head forward. What is their circulation? Are they pink? Are they mottled? And sometimes you have to undress them a little bit to be able to see that. But you're getting that first impression. And EMPC will talk about the sick, the sicker, the sickest. So just the fact you showed up, you're sick. You're sicker if you have one of the three things we're looking at is abnormal. Your sickest patients have two out of the three, there's something wrong. And sometimes it may be they have all three, so there are some abnormalities. So what do we do when we get that cross-room assessment triangle? Now we wanna know a little bit more about them. 
What was their chief complaint? Why did the parent bring them in? And there's different mechanisms you can use. There's the missed algorithm and there's a sample. Don't worry about if you can't remember those algorithms, but you're getting the same information. You wanna know what was the mechanism? What kind of injuries or illness do they have? What are the signs and symptoms that they're having? And has the parent or EMS who brought them in, has any kind of treatment been done? Because some of these kids will look well, was it a Tylenol overdose? Well, what do we wanna know? We wanna know how much they took and how long they took it. Because like we said, the silent killer could have been, right now they look great, but 24 hours from now, they're not gonna look so well. Were they in a car accident? How fast was it going? Did they fall? How far did they fall? You can start to anticipate some of the injuries that they, the child may have. Was it a high speed? Was it a low speed? Do they fall twice their height? We're thinking in trauma, anticipating bigger injuries. So we get a little bit more details because then we're trying to figure out, are they sick? And a lot of the information we're getting from the parents and the caregiver, whoever is bringing them in is we can get from, while we're getting the story, we're looking and examining the patient. Use your senses. What do you see? What do you, what do you smell? Can you smell acidotic or is the DKA we're starting to think about? Some people can smell it, some people can't, but are you starting to smell some of that? Do you see a rash? Is it a petechial rash? That's a red flag. There's a million different rashes out there. Trust me, you're not gonna learn them all. The ones we worry about, does the child look sick with it? Is it petechial? Is it, is it purple? Does it blanch? Does it not blanch? Do they have a fever with it? A neonate with a fever of 100.4, that's a red flag. We start thinking sepsis. A child who's had a fever for more than three days, either with an unknown source or it's not getting any better, that's a red flag for us. Do they have some of their skin is, is a rash and it's peeling off and they don't look well? That's a red flag for us. And this can all be done just by looking at the child. The other thing you wanna start thinking about, which just sets up red, red flags, are their comorbidities. There's a lot of different chronic illnesses out there. There's multiple thousands of syndromes. You don't have to be an expert and know all of them. Use the parent for that. They're the expert. They're the ones that are gonna know. But it's important to get what are the norms? What is the child's normal temperature? So is their normal temperature, do they run it like 96, 97? So the fact that they're 99 is a fever for them, which would be a, a red flag. Ask the caregiver, what is their baseline? So then you know where to build from there. What is abnormal? Do they normally interact and talk? Or are they nonverbal at baseline? Do they normally have a tone and now they don't? Finding out those little bit of differences and asking them, what are they concerned about? Because do they have a cardiac history and are they acyanotic or cyanotic to begin with? Are they on a beta blocker that already because they have a history of SVT? So we know that that heart rate is not as reliable. So the thing's gonna know. And be okay to say to the parent if you don't recognize a certain syndrome, um, to ask them a little bit more about it. Because that will also help you anticipate and figure out whether we should be concerned or not concerned. These kids are often more at risk for sepsis when you have like a lot of the kids with the trachs or some of the other issues. So these can be red flags, so red, sorry, red flags for them. What is also we need to take into account is mental health. This is a new phenomenon that's been growing over the years and we're seeing a lot more. And if you work in the emergency room, then we're I'm sure well, you'll have seen it. And remembering that the mental health population and behavioral health is it takes is about 25% of the patients that we see. And it makes sense. The pediatric population itself is about 25% of our population. So if you're in a freestanding ED or in a, one that does not have a pediatric area that's separate, you can anticipate that it'll be about 25% of your patients are gonna be pediatric patients. So they really like are one fourth. So being able to recognize this and realizing that 25% of those are going to be behavioral health patients that come in. And that is just as much of a crisis in a red flag and concerns as the medical issues. Are they suicidal? Are they homicidal? Are they having behavior outbursts? And if this is something new for the, the child, these outbursts or their, this change, we have to roll to make sure there's nothing medically going on with them. But then sort of looking, is there drug use? And asking the questions. A red flag, does a child not make any eye contact? Is their affect flat? Have they tried to hurt themselves in the past? And asking them, and sometimes they may be pulling them aside 
These are kids you also have to make sure getting them undressed, looking at them. Are they self-injury behaviors? Are they cutting? Are they bruising? You need to undress them. And again, we talked a little bit about what is the parent concerned about? Why did they bring the child in? And it may be something very simple, it may be something very subtle, or maybe something a little bit more serious. But it's important to take their concerns, listen to them, and take them seriously, and find out all the information you can from them. Because a lot of these kids, they can't speak for themselves. If they're an older child, you can ask the older child, what are you here for? Do you know why? What are you concerned about? You get a lot farther if you get the parents on board with you. And once you get a little bit of this story, again, and especially in these days and age with the pandemic and everything, I think we've gotten better at our isolation, where we might have taken some of our PPE stuff for granted. Remember to protect yourself first and protect the, the children. Do you have a child who is, is neutropenic or they're not vaccinated? These are all things that we wanna make sure we're protecting ourselves and protecting our patients and our other family members. So this is important, it should be done right away in the first steps. All right, so we've got a little bit of the story. So remember, now we're gonna do it in our ESI scores. And this is from the latest version from e the ENA, uh, who has given us permission to use this slide. The ESI algorithm is the same for pediatric as for adults. The level ones are level ones. These are the kids, are they seizing? Are they cardiac arrest? These ones self-identify. What we're worried about more is the twos, the threes. Are they saying red flags? And more for than the adults, we have to consider their danger zone, their vital signs. Getting that set of vital signs. Remembering that Brady is bad, we don't want him too low, but you have to know the normals to know what the red flags are. Remembering, so you have a child who comes in with a fever. That heart rate's gonna go up 10 points for every degree above normal. Their respiratory rate's gonna go up about four times for every degree above normal. Kids also they will compensate with their heart rate. So it's in order to go up, it's gonna go up with the fever, it's gonna go up with the anxiety, it's gonna go up with pain. So it's making sure we're getting those vital signs using the appropriate size equipment when we're obtaining these vital signs is very important. And it's gonna fit your blood pressure, we're not as concerned about in the pediatric, the younger pediatric patient as we are the older. When they're adolescents, they will start more like adults because it's such a very late sign, we're more interested in their mental status. Is there an alteration in their mental status that is more of a red flag to us than we're looking at just their blood pressure. And the tip when you're getting vital signs, leave them in the parent's lap as long as you can. Have them help, talk to them in terms and words that, that make sense to them. Don't know that I'm taking your blood pressure to them, that toddler, that's a child, you, what are you taking something? I'm gonna give your arm a little hug, use the term that they're familiar with and are more comforting, get down to their level, bend down a little bit, make eye contact with them, let it make it feel less threatening. So we get to pediatric vital signs, I'm talking a little bit about that. It's good to know norms. Don't, if you haven't memorized this, it's okay. You just a rule of thumb, anything above 200 is bad and anything below 60 is bad when it comes to a heart rate in an infant and pretty much even then with the older adolescent. Blood pressure, it's a very late sign. So what do we worry about? A algorithm or formula that you can use is 70 plus two times the age is your lowest norm for a blood pressure for kids of age one to 10. Once they go above 10 years old, they are more on the adult algorithm and we can say less than 90 would be, would be a low blood pressure. When we talked about the child with the fever for three days, we're talking about a child with a fever over 102 for three days, not the low grade, but more of over 102. Neonate, uh, blood pressure anything below 60 is starting to become hypotensive. A narrowing pulse pressure means they could be dehydrated or hypovolemic shock. And hypovolemic shock is one of the most common forms of shock in the pediatric patients. If they are hypertensive, are they crying? Do you have the right size cuff on? There are kids that have kidney disease, cardiac, adrenal functions, and that can cause some hypertension, but that's rare in, in our behavior and with our pediatric patients. So we've gotten our vital signs. Let's get a little bit more into our ABCs, our assessment, our primary assessment. Airway. 
we know, are they alert? Can they protect their airway? Are you hearing any audible noises? Was this a sudden onset of strider? Do they have inspiratory or expiratory strider? Do they have strider at rest? That's a red flag for a strider at rest is, is bad. Are they drooling? And I'm not talking about the running around happy little baby who's, who's drooling and smiling and laughing. I'm talking about the child who's drooling, but also looks like they are in distress. That will be a red flag. Do you notice any swelling? Think of thing, do they have like a foggy cough or they become cyanotic? Are you thinking of pertussis? Have they not been vaccinated against it? Was it a sudden onset in the thinking foreign body? That's a red flag. If they are voice sounds muffled, see if they can open their mouth. Not going any distress. Do you see an abscess in the back of their throat? Does their tongue look enlarged? Those are red flags. And if you can't really tell if it's being normal, ask the parent, ask the caregiver what they see. And keep that child in a position of comfort. Don't rip them from the parent's arms. If they're having airway issues, don't take them from the parent. Don't worry about the IV. Keep them in a comfort position until they can be seen in, in the position and they may get them appropriate care. So I the time of physical diagnosis, remembering that that baby's airway is the size of their pinky, not your pinky, their pinky. So it's very easy to occlude that airway. So keeping that in position of comfort. If they have those big occiputs, if you're laying them down flat, making sure you're putting a little towel roll underneath so that it's all in alignment. The tongue is abnormally large in toddler, up until at their toddler age, and that can easily become an occlusion. Try to keep everything in alignment. School age children, are you looking in their mouth and there's teeth missing? Well, are they missing teeth to begin with? Is it something that could be including the airway? Get into breathing, some red flags. Brady, apnea, red flags. Are they grunting that little <laughs> after each breath? Are they trying to keep their airways? Red flag. The retractions start low and they work their way up high and they're deeper. So you've got to make sure you're lifting that shirt, you're getting them out of that car seat, looking at them lower to higher. The higher they are, the more in distress they are. Is it greater than a rate of 60? Any age? Do they have circumoral cyanosis? And then neonate, look at their gums. Are they blue? What does their mouth look like? Are there any changes in mental status? Are they starting to go from distress to failure? Distress, they're still growing. They're tachypnic, they're tachycardic. It's when we start slowing down. That's a huge red flag. That means almost like an impending doom. Circulation, RCs. So we talked about the heart rate. Is it high or is it low? Brady and poor perfusion, again, impending doom. We worry about that. That baby looking at in the pictures, are they modeled? We often, when they get cold, you'll start to see some modeling if you expose them for too long, but they should not be modeled in their core. Sometimes we see a little bit in the extremities. That baby is going too far up. If you look at his legs, that's not a good sign. He's having some kind of perfusion issue. Tachycardia is an early sign of shock. Hypotension is a late sign. What is the cap refill? We rely more on cap refill than we do blood pressure. Is it delayed? Is it flashed? Do they have a fever? Is it delayed where they're showing you signs of poor perfusion? Remember these kids will vomit and diarrhea. Well, the vomiting eventually stops, but the diarrhea can still keep going and it pulls that and it can really cause those kids to become dehydrated and go into hypovolemic shock. And sometimes it takes just that one last bowel movement to do that. So it's frequent assessment. What are their colors? What is their skin temperature? Are they mottled? Are they warm? Do they have tears? Now this isn't always work for our younger infants because you usually don't develop tears till you're about two weeks to three months of age. So it's not an accurate assessment for that age group. But as children get older, that four or five year old, if they have, do they not have tears when they're crying? Do you have sunken eyes? Fontanelle, lift that baby upright, feel the top of their head in the upright position, make sure it's not depressed or sunken sunken down. Bleeding. So I'm showing you that there's, they have a 78 to 80 cc's per kilogram volume load. So they can lose up to 30% of their volume before they start showing signs of that blood circulating around. So if you took three medicine cups, try to visualize it, that's about 90 cc's. That's about how much a four to five, four to five kilo child can lose. Sometimes it's hard to visualize that, but just keep in mind that all they have is 78 to 80 cc's of blood circulating around. Disability or neuro. I think when they did the ABCDs, they hello forgot about the neuro. So you get to your GCS. We think of it just for trauma. That can actually be used for any of our 
patients. It's a good screening tool so that next nurse, that next person has an idea where to go on. There's different scales based on infants less than a year, children one to four, and after that, you just use the same as the adult. Are they, are they fussy and they're not consolable? A baby should be able to be consoled. An unconsolable baby, we worry a little bit more. There's sugars, they don't have that. Stores, or if they're lethargic, one of the sort of first things to think about are, have you checked their sugar? Is it high, is it low? Um, did they lose any milestones that they once had reached? Could that child sit? And now all of a sudden mom is saying, he's coming in and he's vomiting and he's not sitting. Red flag that there's something going, maybe going on in his head. Remembering seizures, they look different in babies. It's not your typical all over. It can just be a gaze off to one side. Babies should be able to tra trace and track. If they can't, that's a red flag. We talked before, get them up, get them naked, what it looks like, make sure we don't have any rashes, patterns of bruising. Kids under the age of, of four, they can't really tell us. And then the nonverbal kids, where their voice, they have to have to look at them to see if you're any signs. We're screening for child abuse. Some special considerations, some different groups we've talked a little bit about so far. <laughs> You've got our non-accidental trauma, our child abuse, the neonates who are not like the rest of us, and the chronic kids. The non-accidental trauma, this is a good algorithm to use. The 10 and fours, any bruising on their torso, ears, or neck, or any of these frenulum tears, do they have bruising behind the ears, the closed cheeks? Do you just get a sixth sense that there's something wrong? Do they have pattern bruising? Remember, these should all be reported and taken further look into. It's not our job to figure it out who did them. That is the child services job, but we should be reporting these and looking more into them. Trust your gut. Those are all red flags for areas. Okay, good. On trafficking, remembering that it's not just adults, it can be for children too. And it's not just girls, it can be for boys. And those group home kids are an easy target. There are tools online that can help. Listen to the story, do they have pattern um, tattoos or markings? Do they have things that they shouldn't have? Or just listen to the story. Is they coming in for sexual assault? Do they have STIs? We talked a lot about the neonate so far, remembering that baby that can't be consoled, that's a red flag. Do they have hypoxic or hypoglycemic? Check their sugars. Do they have a fracture? Do they have something simple as a hair tourniquet? Looking all around, remember those, that hair can wrap around things and cause them pain. Their abdomen, is it distended? Is it firm? Those are all red flags. Do they have bilious stool or emesis? Those are red flags we get concerned about. Talked about assessing the fontanelles, having them upright, bulging. They've got some intracranial pressure, sunken, they're dehydrated. They should be able to fix and focus. They should have the reflexes, that startle reflex, that Babinski, their toes widen up up until when they can walk. If they're not eating, huge red flags. Babies and toddlers, they like to eat. They like to play. If those things aren't happening, those are red flags. The seizures, remember in neonates, they look a little different. They could just have the gaze or the bicycling movement. All things to watch for. They don't look like your typical seizures. And that will about wrap it up for me today. I wanted to say, remembering kids are not just a little adult, so I hope I was able to touch on a little bit of those red flags and make our patients not so scary. Remembering a truly sick child will identify themselves. Use your cross the room assessment, that pat, that three to five seconds, and do a little detective work. Know your norms versus your abnormals. Thank you again for listening. If you have any questions, you can reach out the NA. They are great resources through EMPC and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jen, for that very enlightening um, uh, discussion on the red flags in the pediatric patient. And this concludes our first session of the, pedi the Pediatric Emergency Care Coordinator Resource Series. And thank you very much for all you do for the pediatric patients.